Good morning, and may I welcome everybody to the 7th Public Petitions Committee meeting 2015. I would remind everybody to switch off mobile phones and electronic devices as they do interfere with the sound system. And apologies have been received from John Pentland and Kenny McCaskill. Agenda item one is consideration of current petitions. The first item of business is a consideration of the five continued petitions. The first is PE1480 by Amanda Coppel on behalf of Frank Coppel Alzheimer's Awareness Campaign on Alzheimer's and Dementia Awareness. Members have a note by a clerk and the submissions. The most recent letter from the Cabinet Secretary advises she met with the petitioner at the end of January and that the Scottish Government is considering what further action it can take to deliver fairer care. Talks have been ongoing with COSLA for some time on the issue. May I invite contributions from committee members? Angus MacDonald. Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, convener. Um, it's, uh, it's certainly encouraging that uh, the Scottish Government has al uh, altered its stance uh, from November 2013 when it stated it had no plans to lower uh, the eligibility criteria uh, to now considering the matter. <clears throat> um, I'm also pleased to see that the petitioner has met with the Cabinet Secretary for Health uh, and that uh, the Cabinet Secretary recognises the, the concerns that have been raised by uh, Amanda uh, Coppell. So, given that the Cabinet Secretary has said she is considering very carefully what uh, further action the Scottish Government uh, could take, it, it would be helpful, I think, to, to seek further uh, clarification from the Scottish Government uh, as to when their, their work um, in this area will reach a conclusion. Jackson Carlow. <coughs> I support that, although I have to say I'm actually rather disappointed by the lack of action and progress from the Scottish Government on this matter. Uh, we did quantify that it's a relatively limited number of people who fall into the category of being um, currently under the age that is eligible for care from whom to whom the benefit would need to be extended. There was general sympathy and support from all parties. I think when we saw the former Cabinet Secretary, there was general sympathy and support expressed. Uh, I'm not really clear why no further action was being considered at that time. I'm obviously pleased that the matter is now being reviewed. Uh, but I don't really feel that this should necessarily, unless someone can flag up to me why that would be, a, a cause for an extended review. Either a decision will be taken and reached that this is a principle that is accepted, or it is not a principle that is accepted. And therefore, in writing to the Cabinet Secretary uh, seeking to find out what um, further action they now consider, um, I think it would be fair to say that we would very much welcome some early confirmation of this and for the Cabinet Secretary to explain what she believes the issues are that would be weighing any decision by the government in either direction. John Wilson. Can I support Jackson Carlaw in that assertion? The difficulty with this is that while we may write to the Scottish Government, in the response from the Cabinet Secretary, the Cabinet Secretary makes reference to work being undertaken by COSLA in relation to the financial assessment template. If we are going to write to the Scottish Government, convener, I would suggest we also write to COSLA to find out when they expect to have the financial assessment template uh, ready for use by local authorities throughout Scotland and ask COSLA what discussions they have had with the Cabinet Secretary and her uh, staff regarding the, any changes that may be required in ensuring that the wishes of the petitioner are met in this case. I, I just concur, Jim. Okay. I think it's all that needs to be said has been said. I guess we're I certainly agree with uh, the further comments that have been made. Um, however, if we're writing to COSLA, I'm wondering if there's any merit in writing to the breakaway group, um, <laughs> who have uh, seemed to have formed um, a, a, a separate organisation to COSLA. Uh, however, I'm not sure how many local authorities have actually signed up to that. Um, but it may be something to consider in the future. The committee happy to take on these recommendations? Yeah. The next petition is P1505 by Jackie Watt on the awareness of strep B in pregnancy and infants. Members have a note by a clerk and the submissions. 
May I invite contributions from members, please? Convener, I, I think the petitioner has raised a number of other uh, questions that I think we quite rightly should be asking the Scottish Government to consider. Uh, the petitioner has challenged the views uh, expressed by the Government uh, and has indicated that contrary to the response from the Scottish Government, the testing regime, uh, ECM test, is not, wide, as far as they're aware, not widely available in England, uh, unlike uh, some of the evidence we've received. So I think it would be useful, uh, because the petitioner has raised a number of additional questions, uh, to submit these further questions to the Scottish Government and seek their responses to the issues raised. Uh, the only other issue I'd want to raise in this matter, convener, is the issue around... Uh, patient-centred care. Uh, now, the response from the Scottish Government indicates that it would be up to the clinician to decide whether or not they felt that the, it would be appropriate for a test to be carried out. I, I think we may want to get a message out to the Government that given that we consider uh, patient-centred care to be at the heart of NHS provision, that it may be worthwhile reconsidering the wishes of the patient uh, in circumstances where they feel it may be appropriate for an ACM test to be carried out at, at their wish, not purely at the clinician's whim. Yes, MacDonald. Okay, thanks, <coughs> convener. As John Wilson rightly says, the petitioner has raised a number of, of further uh, points which merit a response, uh, I think, from the Scottish Government. Um, she states in her response to um, the Scottish Government's latest letter uh, that it raises even more questions. Uh, so I think we should feed these points back to the Scottish Government uh, uh, to seek their, their further response. And in, in addition, uh, um, I think it would be helpful if uh, the Scottish Government could provide a time frame for the publishing of the revised booklet, A Ready Steady Baby, which uh, will contain information about Strep B, uh, as they've promised to include it in the, the next edition. So it would be good to find out when that's due out. Any other contributions from members? Members happy to take these recommendations forward? <coughs> the next petition is PE1531 by Ashley Husband Poulton on re removing charitable status from private schools. Members have a note by the clerk and the submissions. May I invite contributions from the members, please? Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, convener. Um, it's, it's clear that, uh, as this petition has progressed, um, it's, it's generated quite a bit of debate uh, and also flagged up a number of issues regarding state schools. Um, it's, it's interesting to note, for example, that local authorities have discretion uh, to apply rates relief to non-profit-making organisations such as schools. Uh, so that may be a way forward uh, for the future, um, perhaps creating a level playing field, to coin a phrase, for both uh, state and private schools. Uh, and I believe the figures would be in the region of £150 million for state-funded schools and around £9 million for uh, independent schools, although uh, one report I read, I think it was in the Sunday Herald, mentioned £4 million, but uh, I think it's probably nearer the £9 million for independent schools. So cl clearly, um, state schools uh, deliver a, a social good um, so perhaps they should be entitled to, to the relief as well. Um, and much of the debate has centred on, on whether or not private schools deliver a social good as well. So can we, I think uh, there's an argument perhaps to ask Oscar uh, to carry out some research regarding the contribution of private schools on the basis that Oscar must substantiate uh, that these schools are delivering a social good. So I would um, suggest that we write to Oscar asking them to uh, undertake some research uh, with regard to the, um, the, the social good that uh, is derived from private schools. Any other members? Yeah, Chair, um, I would agree with both sentiments. I think that uh, what needs to be established is the, is the fact that there's a social good, and um, I think if the state schools are, are looking for this type of relief as well, then 
I think it's appropriate that we do ask Oscar to give us some guidance on this and, and carry out some work so that we can be better placed to make a decision. Any other members? Jackson Cannell. Um, yes, I'm, I'm interested in that observation. Obviously, um, that is what is currently required. And my understanding is that is what Oscar do. And of course, many private schools, uh, independent schools have been found wanting and have had to uh, correct the level of um, contribution that they are seen to make. So I don't think it's so much a case of challenging Oscar and all of this. The government monitors the work that Oscar do. It seems to be content that Oscar is functioning in the way that it was intended, that the legislation is actually operating. And I'm quite happy for Oscar to be invited to produce a report detailing what they think they've done and, and where they think they've progressed to. Uh, when we took evidence uh, at the first, on the first instance, I did float the idea of state schools being... Uh, extended the relief and I, I have to say I remain in favour of that. It seems to me a, a perfectly equitable thing. I gather there are some technicalities actually with the law as to how it would have to be managed but I believe it could be managed. But can I also say that I do find the correspondence we're receiving from the petitioner um, to be intemperate, uh, to be lacking in respect to Parliament and to this committee and to demonstrate a level of immaturity. Uh, and I have to say I regret that. I haven't found it constructive in the slightest, and the letter I have before me from the petitioner this morning is not one which is inclined to uh, encourage me to think warmly of the approach that has been conducted. It has to be said that the suggestion of Angus MacDonald to extend uh, charitable status beyond the independent sector was loftily dismissed by the petitioner when evidence was taken on the first occasion. Um, and, you know, talk of extending a broader review of the uh, Act, I think, is extraordinary. Too. Some 20,000 charities are involved in all of that, and I, I think that the uh, implications in terms of uh, the time cost and the aims and objectives that would underpin of that, any of that are not clear. So I'm, I, I, I'm quite happy, as Angus MacDonald has suggested, to ask for some sort of report as to how they feel they've conducted... I'm sure they've already, in fact had to make such a report, so I think if such a report could be made available to the committee, that would, I think, satisfy that, in fact, the terms of the Act and the regulations are being rigorously enforced, as I think is evidenced by comment in the public media where a number of schools have had to adjust the um, support that they give. John Wilson. Convener, can I say that in some of the evidence that we've received for discussion today has been quite interesting particularly the evidence uh, submission from the independent schools. Uh, the issue for me and amongst us is we seem to be pulling two things together. and it's, I think it's the definition of private schools versus independent schools uh, because the, the issue here, and I've done some calculations, and based on the letter from the independent schools, uh, the, it works out that some 22.2% uh, 22 of pupils attending uh, independent schools in Scotland are in some form of grant support or funding support. However, part of that calculation takes in the schools that provide additional supported needs for pupils in Scotland, uh, schools like Donaldson's, uh, where there is quite clearly... Uh, a need for that type of school provision because local authorities themselves feel it's more uh, valuable to actually have that specialist support uh, being provided for some of these pupils. So if we are writing to Oscar uh, and the Scottish Government, could I ask that we request that they break down uh, what is meant by independent or uh, private schools in Scotland? Because uh, unfortunately I think some of the, what I would consider the more charitable elements within the uh, private or independent schooling system uh, are lumped together, which actually uh, mixes up the message of what we're trying to do uh, and what we're trying to examine, because I think there are a number of uh, good school provision, uh, but it's the additional supported need provision that we need to separate out, because we need to understand that the independent school sector, the private school sector, is not all the same. There are uh, schools there that are included in that private or independent sector that are actually providing valuable services. Not that all schools don't provide valuable services, but there are particular schools that are delivering uh, special additional supported needs 
the pupils uh, in Scotland today. Uh, and I think we need to take uh, or recognise that situation is separate from some of the other arguments that Jackson Carlow has quite uh, rightly identified in terms of the petitioners' uh, issues regarding uh, private education in Scotland today, because I think we need to get that distinction made. Uh, that unfortunately, we do have uh, two elements in the education system included in the independent school sector, uh, and I would like to see that if we can, separated out so that we're clear about the 600 pupils or students who are actually on full means-tested support when they receive education and the ones that are receiving some form of bursary support or support from within the education, private education sector itself. Jackson Carlos. The only slight confusion I have arising from that is that what Oscar are required to ensure is that any school that is currently covered within uh, the charitable status terms has to demonstrate that it, irrespective of its uh, founding principles or definition, is meeting the test. So whilst I think it might be, I'm not sure how interesting it would be to have the, 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 the number of pupils educated in either sector identified, it wouldn't really mitigate the need for each and every school to be able to demonstrate that it was fulfilling the obligations in order to be eligible for the charitable status. And so, I, I mean, I, I think Angus MacDonald's initial request is one which incorporates what effectively would have to be their judgment of their work in ensuring that the charitable test is fulfilled for ever, by everybody. Convener, just to, in response to that, it depends who sets the test and how that test is applied. Uh, and I think one of the issues that's been raised by the petitioner is that I think he quite clearly identifying, that in his view, uh, the test isn't currently sufficient uh, to determine whether or not those school, some of the schools in the private or independent school sector should be receiving charitable status. And what I'm, I, what I'm saying is that I think there are schools that genuinely would meet, I think, society's wider concern about charitable uh, status uh, compared to some of the other fee-paying schools that exist in Scotland that may be run and operated on a profit basis or a not-for-profit basis distribution system. The, is that not or the responsibility of Oscar? I mean, is that not their raison d'etre? It's, it's not the raison d'etre of this committee. It's the raison d'etre of Oscar to ensure that they believe that the test is being adequately applied. Under guidance from this, the government. Um, can I just say that Oscar um, assessed uh, school by school, not across the sector. So it's an individual school they're assessing every time on their charitable status, yeah. like any individual group who um, hand in their uh, accounts or whatever at the end of the year. It's assessed as an individual group. Are we happy to take Angus MacDonald's recommendations forward? The next petition is PE 1541 by Chris Comer on the flower of Scotland to be officially recognised as Scotland's national anthem. Members have a note by a clerk and the submissions. May I invite contributions from members, please? Come on, Jackson. <laughs> I was obviously somewhat disappointed not to be here when you were able to take evidence on this petition having something of a track record of commenting on the number of petitions we receive encouraging us to adopt a national this, that or the next thing. Um, but my understanding is that a lack of enthusiasm was expressed by the Scottish Government for moving forward uh, at this time. Um, and it is interesting, I think, to see uh, the level of... Uh, because, curiously, I think this has actually stimulated... The existence of this petition has actually stimulated something of a limited national debate on the issue... Uh, and a little bit, it seems like Marmite, uh, this particular anthem is either loved or loathed. Um, I, I think myself that at this stage it would be inadvisable for a committee of MSPs to embrace any particular anthem. I think the issue may arise in due course in some way, but I would 
prefer to follow a natural evolutionary route at this time and believe that at this point I would suggest the petition be closed. Here we come. Uh, yes. Uh, thanks, Commissioner. Yeah, I think uh, consensus is breaking out on this one. Perhaps um, uh, clearly from the submissions that we've had um, from um, a number of uh, contributors, uh, the, the jury's still out as to which is the best national anthem for Scotland. Uh, and I think the, in all the evidence that we've received, um, the most salient point in, in all of it is in the letter from the Scottish Government uh, and dated the 13th of February and the final paragraph in which it states, Scottish ministers believe that consideration of whether Scotland should officially adopt a national anthem and if so, what that might be, should not be led by the Scottish Government or by any single political party. We therefore have no current plans in this regard. So I think given that um, that's the position of the Scottish Government uh, and given that uh, there's still a considerable amount of debate out there as to what the national anthem should be, um, I think we should uh, um, perhaps close the petition um, reluctantly uh, and allow the debate to continue out there, outside. Uh, yes, um, I believe the, the petitioner was very passionate in his presentation in regards to considering the anthem, but I think even on the day it was suggested that perhaps more work needed to be done. Uh, I, I don't see that's happened to date, uh, and hence uh, I think I would go along with what's being suggested today, that with the absence of uh, additional support and works, in terms of justification of which anthem that should be adopted, I, I'm of the same view. It still allows the petitioner to come back with fresh information and a later date, and quite happy to look at and re-examine it at that stage. Does the committee have to close the petition then? Agreed. <clears throat> the next petition is PE1542 by Evelyn Mundell on behalf of Ben Mundell and Malcolm and Caroline Smith on the human rights for dairy farmers. Members have a note by a clerk and the submissions. And may I welcome Jamie McGregor, MSP, to meeting today. And Mr McGregor has a constituency interest in this petition. Uh, can I invite contributions from the committee? Can Jimmy I make McGregor? It? Right. Um, as, as members will know, I've spoken on this two or three times before on this petition. It's a long-running thing. Um, and... Um, Thank you uh, for allowing me once again uh, to make a statement on, in support of my constituents, Mr. and Mrs. Mundell, and other affected dairy farmers they represent, several of whom I know. Uh, my constituents are disappointed with the responses received following their appearance at the committee on January the 13th. Uh, they remain of the view that this issue is a human rights one, since the affected dairy farmers in the ring fence area were prevented by government from using their property, i.e. the quota they owned, to allow their businesses to survive. All other dairy farmers out with the ring-fenced areas were able to sell their milk quota. Many of those in the ring fence were dairy farmers with less good quality land, which meant they were unable to diversify into alternatives such as arable crops, and many therefore went out of business and individual dairy farmers were not consulted before the ring fence was decided upon. My constituents believe that the Scottish Government has repeatedly failed to address their concerns and recognise that their human rights were infringed. While we are aware that the Rural Affairs Committee has been looking at the current and very significant challenges facing the Scottish dairy sector, this is quite a separate issue, and they would welcome the Public Petitions Committee continuing their petition and asking further detailed questions of the Scottish Government on this matter, as they suggest in their own response. And they would also like to present scanned copies of further evidence on the case uh, for the perusal of members of the committee and ask if they can be allowed to do this and for the petition to remain open. Thank you, Jamie McGregor. Any other? Yeah. Um, I'm of a similar opinion. Uh, I do believe that there's a case to be answered. And also, uh, um, I see from the Cabinet Secretary's response as well that there seems to be um, a, a measure of acceptance as well, and I think that's helpful. 
Therefore, I would suggest that perhaps we would continue open and, and look for the, the fresh evidence that's being presented to see how it would help the situation. Angus MacDonald. Yeah, um, thanks, convener. I think the mic's working. There we go. Um, you, you'll be aware, convener, um, that I, I raised the issue of, of ring fencing with the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Richard Lockhead, when he was giving evidence uh, to the Iraqi Committee um, during the uh, urgent inquiry into the, the, the dairy crisis, uh, and as he pointed out, that at the time the, the milk quota system is being phased out at a European level, uh, therefore the, the ring fencing in the Southern Isles and Kintyre um, and Orkney will ultimately be less relevant or indeed just uh, academic. Um, he did, however, he raised the point that protection uh, to the island communities as far as dairy production is concerned uh, still needs to be looked at and uh, I take on board the petitioner's views that um, it hasn't been helpful to have the ring fencing um, in, in that particular part of Scotland. Um, however, the, the petitioners clearly feel that um, they've got a, 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 a retrospective case uh, with regard to, to their human rights um, but I, I, I think that would require to go down the legal route rather than um, the petitions committee taking any further action. Um, clearly, if there's a challenge to the Scottish government, it has to be done in the courts, not uh, not through the not through this committee. So um, I would uh, I would be of the view to to close the petition, um, or at least wait until uh, we have the debate at the end of the month uh, and see if the issue is discussed at. Uh, in the, in the chamber. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, no, I'm, I, I, I would, I'm optimistic, and I, I always feel that people should be given the extra mile. And the fact that the petitioners are prepared to bring fresh uh, information, I think that's helpful. Uh, and therefore, um, I think we shouldn't crush people's hopes and aspirations, and we should allow that to come forward and allow us to look at that as well. Uh, and, and I don't think I don't believe that it would be helpful to close it at this stage. I think we should allow that extra mile and allow that uh, information to come forward. I would. I'm very keen to see it. Jackson Carlo. I, I noticed that um, Angus Macdonald did put questions to the Cabinet Secretary uh, to Committee um, elsewhere, um, and the Cabinet Secretary undertook to consider these matters. And I think there is an expectation that they might be addressed in the debate that is taking place, but the debate itself could very well, as debates very often in this Parliament do, uh, focus on some other aspect of the dairy industry, and we might find after the debate that there hasn't really been a satisfactory further examination of this issue. So I think it would be wise to take into account the debate itself and for us to make a determination on the back of that whether or not the Cabinet Secretary has been able to give further expression to the thinking that he said he was going to do, and if not, for us to write to the Cabinet Secretary asking him where that has taken him to. Is the committee quite happy with that? Yeah. Thank you. I thank Jimmy McGregor, MSP, for attending today. Thank you very much. Can I suspend for a few minutes to enable a petitioner to be seated at the table for the next item on the agenda, please.
Agenda item two, consideration of new petitions. Our next item of business is consideration of new petitions. The committee will hear from the petitioners for two of these petitions. The first new petition is PE 1551 by Scott Patterson on the mandatory reporting of child abuse. Members have a note by a clerk, the Spife Racing and the petition. May I welcome Scott Patterson to the meeting. I would now invite Mr Patterson to speak to his petition for no more than five minutes to explain what the petition seeks, after which we will move to questions. I'm here today to protect and speak out for the most vulnerable, the most abused innocents that have had their humanity taken away from them by a sickness that has been in this country for far too long. There are satanic people in society that are and have been involved in the most sickening acts that involve sexual abuse, torture, and even murder. This cannot go on, and this is why I'm here to try and protect victims from institutions that have utterly failed in many incidents to protect and care for in the matter they deserve. From Kerry Law, Dolphin Square, Larch Grove Boys Home, Kinkora Boys Home, Nazareth House, Rotherham, where the council has resigned in mass when over a thousand children were found to be abused, Fort Augustus School in Loch Ness, Nottingham Care Homes, that involved the police investigation called Operation Daybreak, to name but a few, where abuse has taken place and not been acted on. Continue. That's it. That's it. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Patterson. Could I ask um, the National Guide for Child Protection in Scotland 2014 is wide ranging and relevant legislation in relation to uh, child protection. Why do you not think it's sufficient? I think with, with some of the incidents that I've mentioned that there's been a history of people that have just not been heard. I think with the induction of mandatory child abuse reporting that it will enable people from the within the care services to come forward and not be afraid. And in essence, I think that this will push people to make the right decisions about the people who are the real victims. Thank you. Um, I've only one other further question. Where it's mandatory in places like Canada, Australia, the US, a, there, there has been no convictions for not reporting uh, child sex abuse. Do you think that the system would work here in the UK? There would be convictions if you didn't report it. Uh, with regards to America, the, they have had a success in bringing this in, especially with the percentages and the amount of people that have been helped. But I, I just feel at the moment that we, we have to bring this in because the time is right, especially with our current climate. I mean, what the media has reported, and especially in Scotland, I feel that it would be a great success because there is scandals surrounding places in Scotland that could have been helped but weren't. Okay, so thank you. Um, John Wilson? Just for clarification, Mr. Patterson, in terms of your petition, you're talking about 
making a, a criminal offence to fail to report uh, child abuse. Could you give us some indication of who you mean or the, what organisations would be encompassed by this proposal? Uh, because it's, at the present moment, the way it's worded is quite broad. Uh, and do you mean everybody in society, if anybody, or any one of us sitting around this table or sitting in the gallery today were to uh, fail to report it, would we be potentially subject uh, to a criminal offence? From the wording of my petition, I meant it in regards of people who are caring for the most vulnerable and who have a duty to look after their interests and well-being. Um, that's that where my main concern is. One of the issues that this committee has previously examined in a petition was the child sexual exploitation, and you made reference to a number of cases that are currently live in relation to child sexual exploitation in the UK as a whole. Uh, so we as a committee have made recommendations to the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government have taken on board most of the recommendations made by this committee. Do you, is there anything other than what we have, as a committee have already recommended uh, that you think should be put in place? Because we are working at the present moment with legislation that was just introduced in 2014. So therefore, would it not be advisable to give that legislation some, an opportunity to bed in rather than moving to criminalise uh, the failure to, abuse, uh, to report abuse when we expect uh, through the name person route and through uh, recommendations to teaching staff, medical staff and others in society that they should be more vigilant and more aware of any abuse that may take place because do you think in those circumstances it would be advisable to let the legislation bed in rather than taking further action at the present moment? I feel it could be done in conjunction with it. Um, there definitely is a system that can be used that will work with my proposals. And I think that with the structure in place and with the right people, and the whole thing could fit together like a jigsaw. Um, I, yeah. Right, thank you. You, you indicated uh, in one of your comments about the most vulnerable children. Yeah. Uh, clearly what has been identified in the media is that sometimes we do not fully understand where uh, child sexual exploitation is taking place and where abuse is taking place. And in some cases, it's been reported that they, it's happened to children that would not have, an, under normal circumstances, been viewed as being vulnerable children. What would you say, would you, would you want this to encompass every child rather than just those who are most vulnerable or identified as most vulnerable? Primarily, I would have to say that the ones put in care homes or any kind of institution, I feel it has to be these places because through uh, my own personal experience, I think that there are people out there who are predators and who look for these opportunities to embed themselves within these services. And there's been a lot of occasions that this has been the case. Thank you very much indeed. Jackson Cannell. Uh, good morning. Um, obviously, there's a very heightened atmosphere at the present time surrounding uh, these issues, and almost daily there's further information coming into the public domain, which, of course, I think is undermining public confidence quite considerably. Um, since you lodged your petition, um, the Prime Minister's office has stated that new criminal sanctions for those who fail to 
uh, protect children from sexual exploitation are going to be at the package of at the heart of a new pack, uh, of package of measures to be announced imminently. Um, they do, in the terms of reference, appear to include the sorts of issues that you have identified. Um, given that, it is what you would hope for that rather than having um, a piecemeal approach to this, it would be useful for there to be a fairly standard and common analysis and legal basis established across the whole of the United Kingdom uh, to any further extension of measures in this area? I think that what they're proposing at Westminster could be made available for the whole country, um, but maybe it would undermine your position as a parliament. I'm not sure on that, but I think that we we would probably have to act independently because the England situation and the Scotland situation are are different um, in regards to it seems to be more reported down in England than it is up here. And so I think a different model would need to be implemented due to the difference of the two countries. I mean, it w we would certainly have to legislate separately. There's no question of that. But legislate in similar terms so that there was a common understanding of what the offence might be. Yeah, yeah, right. definitely. Okay. Um, could I give my apologies and welcome Jamidi to committee in place of a substitution for Kenny McCaskill? Was that it? Yeah. Um, <coughs> good morning, Scott. Uh, hey. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Uh, it's very impressive. Uh, yeah, um, I, I like what you say. Um, I would have liked to have covered all children, not just only those who are in one form of institution or another. But, and I'm, I'm also glad and grateful that you, you are allowing us to give it consideration in terms of how it would affect children in Scotland. I think that's important. You're quite right. Mm -hmm. um, um, Kameera, I'm, I'm very happy for this to be continued uh, and um, possibly even get advice from the, uh, our legal committees to see w what light they can throw on if they are in the process of actually trying to introduce legislation, it might be an idea to ensure that we encompass this while this is going on rather than an add-on at a later stage. I think it would probably be more appropriate and I think it would probably satisfy Scott in what he's trying to achieve as well. Any other questions from Jim Eady? Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, Mr. Patterson. Hi. Thank you for your evidence this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a um, point of clarification, and that is in terms of the scope of what you're proposing, is it that this would apply to professionals working in child protection, or would it be wider in its application in terms of covering the general uh, public? I feel that this petition has to be targeted at people who work in care homes and also people who work within social services. Those in perhaps hospitals, but not as much. Uh, but the main ones for me would have to be care homes and social services. OK, thank you for that. Um, have you given any um, thought or consideration to the possibility of there being any adverse unintended consequences arising from what you propose, particularly in relation to um, diverting resources towards investigation of complaints, um, which may, in, in an environment where there are limited resources, um, mean that the focus is not on children who are at risk? Yeah, most definitely that's a very good point you've raised. Um, there is a real danger of people being taken away for the wrong reasons, which has happened in the past. Uh, children taken away from their families through misreporting of abuse. Um, I think that... Uh, 
as in him. Yeah, that's. I don't think I've answered your question too well. <laughs> no, you, you've done. You've done fine. Um, it was really just to un understand whether that was something that you had considered, because if the resources are being diverted towards investigation of what would be um, what would be likely to be an increased number of complaints, there might not be as much resource focused on children who are at risk of abuse. Yeah, that that is a good point, and I would take it on board. Okay, thank you. No further questions. Any further questions? The committee will now decide what action it wishes to take on the petition. Members have a note by a clerk suggesting a possible course of action. What are members' views? Jason Cannell? Well, I, I think given that there is the prospect of uh, some legislation proceeding at Westminster, that it would be helpful to write to the Scottish Government asking whether they plan to have any conversations uh, with Westminster to establish the terms of reference of that legislation and whether they might be minded to move similarly in Scotland. Um, firstly, to establish whether they think whatever is being proposed would have the appropriate scope, but I imagine, too, it would be underpinned by an examination of some of the very issues that um, Jim Eady and others you know, were raising during questioning. Um, but in the first instance, I would have thought it would be helpful to know what that, uh, what that was and for the Scottish Government to familiarise themselves with it because these issues, I think, have now attracted public uh, interest and attention across the whole of the United Kingdom. And I think that there is an argument for a common standard uh, being applied, albeit separately under our respective legislative systems, uh, and legal systems, but uh, there is an argument for a common standard of understanding being applied, uh, which is rigorous, but which is universal. Any other members? Um, the committee members will be aware that there's a national inquiry in this. Um, can I suggest that we write to the Scottish Government um, to s ask what they're doing within this area? On top of what agreed with Jackson? The members agree to it? I'm minded to, that we should write to try and get some fullness to this petition, write to a number of other organisations to seek their views on the, the petition. Uh, a couple of the organisations I was thinking of were particularly Bernardo's, given that they instituted the earlier petition on child sexual exploitation. Uh, if we could write to Bernardo's. But I also think it may be appropriate to write to COSLA as well, because given the petitioners raised the issue about care homes, uh, then clearly COSLA have a role within that in terms of provision, uh, care provision at the present time. I'd also uh, suggest we write to the care inspectorate, uh, because there, there are issues that arise, to, just to find out what their views would be on uh, bringing in such uh, a, you know, a petition and making it you know, uh, a, a situation where you get the criminal offence being instituted uh, because we need to be clear about the types of individuals and organisations uh, that may be encompassed within that type of change in legislation uh, and find out what their views would be in bringing in that type of uh, scenario where legislation is in place uh, in terms of the mandatory reporting. Angus MacDonald. Yeah. In addition, um, convener, it might be helpful to approach the NSPCC um, to seek their views. Um, the Child Protection and Safeguarding Cons Consultancy, Children UK, UNICEF, and Shelter. Um, I think uh, their their views would be helpful. Jimmy D. I think just for completeness and view of the range of organisations that have been highlighted, we should add Children First. Are the committee happy to take all his recommendations? Agreed. May I thank Mr Patterson for attending and giving evidence today. And I now suspend for a minute or so to allow him to leave the table and the next petitioner to take his seat.
The next new petition is P1548 by Beth Morrison on the national guidance on restraint and seclusions in schools. Members have a note by the clerk, the spice briefing and the petition. May I also welcome Graham Day, MSP, to the committee today and acknowledge a letter from Alice McInnes, MSP. May I welcome a petitioner, Beth Morrison, to a meeting. She is accompanied today by Ian Hood from Learning Disability Alliance, Scotland, and Kate Sanger from the Challenging Behaviour Foundation. I now invite Mrs Morrison to speak to her petition for up to five minutes to explain what she is looking for, after which we will go to questions. Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here today with a number of families to ask for your help in ensuring the safety of Scotland's most vulnerable children in Scotland's schools. The use of restrictive practices, including restraint and seclusion in Scottish schools caring for disabled children, is poorly understood and inconsistent, leading to many of our children suffering what we believe is, at best, institutional child abuse and, at worst, criminal assault. My son Callum suffers from epilepsy, sensory and communication difficulties. As a small 11-year-old wearing clothes for an 8-year-old, he came home from school with multiple bruises on his arms and legs. He had abrasions on his spine. His upper chest was covered in a petechial hemorrhaging rash and his lips were blue. The school told me that he had been restrained on the floor by staff. I was also told that he had urinated during the restraint. This happened twice in three days. Because of a current police investigation, I am unable to say much more than that at this time. However, families from all over Scotland have told me about their children being restrained at school, causing injuries like scratches, bruises and abrasions. I have heard of disabled but mobile children who use wheelchairs for extended walks being strapped in by so many straps it was effectively being used as a mobile prison. The straps on one child's wheelchair were so tight the child could hardly breathe. We are also hearing of children being manhandled and dragged into safe spaces without proper supervision or recording. We believe this is a deprivation of their liberty and their human rights. We also believe that in many cases, disabled children are being subjected to restraint or seclusion as a punitive measure. Corporal punishment was banned in Scottish schools more than 30 years ago, but in our opinion, failures in guidance and scrutiny have allowed some schools to effectively reintroduce it illicitly for disabled children. Disabled children have a right to be cared for by school staff who are trained in understanding the function of challenging behaviour. Many children and young people with complex communication disorders, sensory and learning difficulties may present particular behavioural phenotypes. All of these things affect their behaviour, ability to express themselves or to communicate their needs. Our children are often unable to say, I'm hungry, thirsty, tired or I'm in pain. And without the essential training and knowledge to understand the function of the behaviour, Staff use restraint and seclusion to overpower and control the child using brute force, and this is completely unacceptable. We know that our experience is part of a much wider failure of public policy in Scotland, and this is what we desperately need the Parliament to address. Specifically, it's a lack of national guidance on the support and management of behaviour for for children with special needs in schools and appropriate independent regulatory oversight. Some guidance does exist for children in residential care. The document is called Holding Safely. But this was not designed with any consideration of or expertise in disability. As such, it fails to take into account the complex support that young people with special needs require. Holding safely may provide a starting point for a new national policy, but it's not a substitute for it. We need the guidance for protection of children who often lack language skills and who are not believed when they speak up. If there is one thing that Winterbourne View has taught us, it's that sometimes the places that are meant to protect the most vulnerable can, in reality, be the most dangerous. 
At the moment, it's up to each local authority to, ve to develop its own policy on behaviour management and physical intervention. This has led to a massive inconsistency in practice. There is also evidence of outdated thinking and, frankly, inhumane practice, where a failure to show any degree of empathy with or understanding of the child is evidenced by institutional treatment that would never be accepted if practised on a typically developed child. Such ad hoc policies not only result in poor, poor practice, there is little accountability and no effective mechanism for parents or other professionals to challenge failures in, lo in local council schools. This lack of an independent regulator, combined with outdated policies and poor training, is a dangerous combination. It provides an easy pathway for an abusive culture. We need you to make the best practice that's apparent in some schools, and they do exist. Become the norm in every school where special needs children are educated in Scotland, and to ensure that if abuse and neglect does occur, there's a truly independent body that uncovers and deals with it as swiftly as possible. Ladies and gentlemen, there are things that are happening to disabled children in schools that would not be acceptable if those children were not disabled. Throughout Scotland, from Elgin to Edinburgh, Dundee to Dumbarton, we know of children who have been put at risk and are damaged as a result. Please help us protect Scotland's children. Thank you. Cassie, thank you for that. Um, can I ask, um, local authorities um, are responsible for guidelines and training. Do you think there is enough done by local authorities, especially in the training side? Absolutely not. Uh, they're not. They're not doing enough. The training, the training of staff is is really important. Um, I have uh, Kate Sanger here on my right from the Challenge Behaviour Foundation. If you, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll let her talk a little bit about the training. If you don't mind. Yes, it's, it's quite apparent that the staff do lack the training and the skills to understand the function of the challenge in behaviour. And um, I think the staff also are support, um, supported in these instances. And I think if, um, when they're faced with challenging behaviour, they don't understand that the child is trying to communicate a need. And they often respond to it in a more um, um, physical approach or a confrontational approach. And this leads to injury to the child and the staff. Um, and I think if there was clearer um, um, training and support and understanding of why our children challenge, and they do it as best said for the whole load of reasons. Some of them lack um, verbal skills. Some of them have um, complex communication disorders and only understand small chunks of language. So if they're overloaded with language, um, they become anxious and they may try and push the staff away and the staff will respond in a physical manner. So there is a greater need for, um, for education for the staff. Can I just add to that? I mean, one of the important things that we'd hope in a national guidance is time for reflection. There's been a lot of talk recently about mindfulness. And if, if there's no time for support staff, for teachers, to take time after incidents have happened to think what happened and what might be dealt with, actually it can be quite easy for those people to think that it was a willful act and not simply something that a child couldn't help. And we, there's some evidence which suggests if teachers and support staff think things are willful, then children should be punished or made to control themselves, as opposed to being a, con a result of their condition. And therefore, we think guidance should be able to influence local policies to actually have that time for mindfulness to develop. Um, can I ask one more question? If national guidelines were implemented, how important is it to you that an independent regulator is appointed as well? Can I, on, on that one, just add that we think this is really important because currently uh, local policies vary quite a lot and it's up to local authorities to decide how their policies are going to be checked. And right now it falls in a, between two stools where residential schools uh, have children staying over. The care inspector has a duty to inspect all aspects of the care. In uh, schools which are day schools, a majesty of inspection for education has to consider issues with behaviour but only in so far as that affects learning or in the management of the school, not in the management of individuals. And therefore, there is nobody right now who will look at the question of what happens to some of the children that we have come across so far. And we think that's a gap, and one that, in fact, in fact it wouldn't take a lot to either extend the care inspector's remit 
or Her Majesty of Inspectors of Education remit to cover that gap. We don't know which is best to do that. We think that's some, a job for somebody who knows a bit more about it than us to do that. But we want this issue to be looked at by those who really do know and understand these issues. Jackson Cardinal. Good morning, and uh, can I congratulate you? I thought it was a very powerful, articulate and um, well-rounded presentation. Can I refer you back to your petition? Because I'm interested in a comment that you make here, that you met the Minister for Children and Young People um, and wrote to the Minister in 2013 and received the response, I hope that you are assured that your concerns have been taken very seriously. Um, I'm going to through shorthand, unless you wish to contradict me, say that you're perhaps not altogether satisfied as a result of that response that they have been. But I wonder if you're able to tell me, are you aware as a result of the meeting and the uh, subsequent correspondence that you had of any actions arising as a result, or are the lists of specific requests that you have identified here the sort of agenda of issues that you have been recommending, which to date you have not managed to achieve any progress or support from the Scottish Government to move forward on? You would be right in assuming that no, we weren't satisfied at the time with the response uh, from the Minister. Um, and yes, we, we've had no feedback apart from, you know, we hope that you're satisfied, which we weren't. We did try and engage again a second time, but we were simply referred to the first reply and told that they wouldn't engage any further, which is most unfortunate. And can I ask the um, guidance that you have produced that you would like to see implemented, um, who has contributed with you to the development of that guidance and what broader coalition of uh, parties do you think now support and have been a party to, um, in a way, almost evidencing the work that you have done? I mean, we've, we've built up quite a group of people uh, who have advised us, which range from people who spend some time teaching restrictive practices to people who are experts within childcare practice. We've had discussions with part of the Children Commissioner's office. We've even got some interest and support from I the, 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 I better just say the uh, the person who supports Childline, uh, whose name is quite well familiar, but I'm not really in a position to, to, to name them here. Uh, and uh, we've had a whole range of, of, of interest in this. And we, we've come up with some ideas. We've drawn that from good practice which exists. But we don't pretend that we know all the answers just now. What we know is that there are some things that have to be addressed, and we know of some of the problems that happen across Scotland that need to be done. So we, we think there's, there's a lot more that can be done on, on, on what we've done. And I think in, in fairness to the Scottish Government, we've been working on this issue for a couple of years. And when we, when we did meet yeah. with them a couple of years ago, this wasn't, National Guidance, wasn't the only thing on the agenda. Right? And it was something that we have developed since then. Right. So in, in, in fairness, we wouldn't say that they've said that they won't do that. They have identified this document, which is called Holding Safely, which you'll have seen mentioned uh, in that as being part of what they think could be useful guidance, but it doesn't refer to education law, it doesn't refer to deprivation of liberty, and it's highly focused on the practice of restraint, not on de-escalation and defusing situations. Uh, finally, convener, it's a, a model of fairness when it comes to the, the Scottish Government, uh, Mr Hood. Um, have you, in fact, though, communicated this agenda of issues to the Scottish Government and had any response to them, or are you bringing them forward publicly to this committee with a view to us potentially uh, exploring them further. So what I'm trying to understand is whether at this stage this is, a, this is new information that the Scottish Government would not have received from you in this particular form. We've chosen to bring it through the Petitions Committee to raise the, the, the points that we wanted to make and to ask for the national guidance. Yeah, that's right. OK, thank you very much. John Wilson. Thank you, Convener. And I'd like Jason Carlo, thank you for your presentation, uh, Ms Morrison. Uh, the issue that Mr Hood raised there was that he indicated there may be good practice out there, uh, and you're drawing down on that good practice. Could you give examples of where that good practice is being delivered uh, and where you feel it may not be being delivered at the present time? Well, obviously, we, I, I don't want to, to go into specific schools, but thankfully, uh, my son was removed from 
the school in which he was hurt. He is now very happily, very well supported in a school locally. And they are excellent. They manage perfectly well. Uh, they concentrate on something called positive behaviour support. The uh, our Angus Council have a no restraint policy, um, and they focus on positive behaviour support, meeting the needs of the child, and that works much better. There's so much evidence out there that you know positive behaviour support with disabled children works. What you need to do is look for the function of the behaviour. And when I say behaviour, I have to make this clear. I'm not just talking about behaviour that you know you and I might think is challenging behaviour as in you know bad behaviour. These are not naughty children. The, there's the most severely disabled children that we're talking about. As we've said, very a lot of them don't have language. Um, you know, to give you an example a child that may not be able to ask to go to the toilet, for example, might just stand and look at you expectantly. Um, and you don't, you know, if you're not trained and you don't understand what the child's trying to say to you, and the child can't say, I need to go to the toilet, it's not long before when that ch child's needs are not met, the child's going to start getting agitated. Can you see where I'm going? So it's about getting to know the children. There's some really good practice in my son's school just now. They really are excellent. Um, they, they meet the child's needs. And if the child's needs are met, there is no need for the child then to progress onto the challenging behaviour. What you have is a what you've got that is a problem is when you've got a school who has a control and management approach and they're not looking at the function of challenging behaviour, then you know their response is to, to just restrain the child, control the child, and that's not what we really want here. Could you just for clarification uh, are those the two schools that you've referred to in terms of your son's case? in the same local authority area? No. Or the, no. Out with, no. So one local authority, and I'm trying to generalise yeah. this, into a local authority <coughs> adopted has adopted the positive behaviour support yeah. model, yeah. and another local authority, the education provision, hasn't adopted that model. Um, at the time when Callum was hurt, his school had what they called a positive handling policy which is not the same. Um, we have a situation where some local authorities have decided to have no policy at all. Um, that, of course, isn't always great either because what happens is that t teachers are left without training then um, and they often manhandle and restrain children based on their own limited personal experience. Um, claiming to use physical restraint as a last resort then becomes no more than a cheap rhetorical phrase and that's impossible to monitor. What we want is the training to be universal and this is why we need the national guidance. There's, there's too many discrepancies, you know, um, one local authority has positive handling, which focuses on the restraint of a child. And then you have another local authority, which is promoting positive behaviour support. And that, much, that really does work much better. But just now, they're all left to do their own thing, which, you know, that, that's not good. We need a national guidance. Mrs Morrison, you made reference to positive handling. I and you talked about, uh, once again, positive behaviour support. In relation to, but you did mention in relation to that response that you felt that some teaching staff weren't adequately trained mm -hmm. uh, in either method, uh, and your, you know, yeah. the, the experience that you've had. Do you feel there is enough training out there for teaching staff to understand the particular needs of uh, children with additional supporting needs uh, in the education system? It unfortunately varies from local authority to local authority, but I would say that in general there is definitely a lack of training across the board. Um, uh, the, the training is there, it's ju it just needs to be accessed um, and brought forward. Whether that's a funding issue, I don't know, but you know, we really do have to have the training. For example, uh, with children with autism on the autistic spectrum, the Scottish Government is introducing a new training strategy across Scotland to try and make sure there's more consistent teaching for staff uh, at different levels about what autism is and how it affects people. But as, right now, it is very much a patchwork across the place. So there are moves to address some of this, but sometimes 
for the, the support staff and teachers that, 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 that Beth is describing. It can be as, as little as four, a four-hour awareness teaching in autism is all that they get. And actually, one thing that we know about children with autism, everyone's a different child yeah. and has different needs. Yeah. Jimmy? No, I was going to just ask Ms Sang Sanger if she had any comments to make, given that their expertise so I, I, in the area. I, I think um, it's come, the time has come to, um, to give the teachers the skills and the training. And I think in Scotland we could be leading the way in doing this because, you know, we will be judged by how we treat the most vulnerable in our society. And it would be good. The change is definitely needed, and it would be good to see Scotland leading the way in this because we're seeing problems up and down the country in this area. And it's not rocket science. You know, if you understand the, the need of a child and you change the environment or you give them the right support, therefore you change their behaviour. And, you know, um, it could be something as simple as the young man who cannot cope in a busy um, activity, and he doesn't have the voice to say it. All you can do is maybe teach him a sign to take a break. Something simple, so the child may be challenging to escape from the situation when all you have to give him is the communication <coughs> skill to, to, to make that difference in his life. Um, and I think Beth, and, Beth has been doing um, some talking to many teachers and she has been astounded by the response from the teachers saying they don't even know what positive behaviour support is which is quite sad. Thank you. Did you meet you? Good morning. And thank you, um, Ms Morrison, for your excellent presentation this morning. Um, can I ask, there is currently, as I understand it, uh, guidance on the use of restraint in residential childcare, holding safely. And in that guidance, there's a statement, and I quote, restraining a child at the right time in the right way for the right reasons can be a better thing to do than failing to restrain them. Can I ask you, therefore, um, is there ever uh, any circumstances in which restraint uh, is uh, an acceptable response within positive behaviour support, or is it something that you would want um, to make a very clear statement about not being acceptable? Can I, can I answer that one? I think, yes, I think when you do a positive behaviour support plan, the plan is made up of proactive strategies, and that has given the children as many um, strategies to help support their behaviour, to um, help their learning. And you also have reactive strategies, and I think um, restraint would come under a reactive strategy. And I think it is um, acceptable when there is danger to life, to the child, um, if they're going to escape from a, a, a building and they could be injured. But it has to be in a plan of a behaviour support. If it has been an emergency um, situation, therefore, after we learn from it and we go back and we include that in part of their plan, but only, I think the British Institute of Learning and Disability say that restraint is acceptable when it is to um, safeguard someone's life or other people involved. But it should always, always be the last resort and it should always be part of a bigger plan. Can I, can I just add to that? Is that holding safely was the big step forward for children in residential care. And actually, it's just highly appreciated by, by, by uh, staff that worked in it. But one clear thing to say is that it makes the recommendation here that all holds that are to be used should be agreed by the child and by their caregiver, by their, by their next of kin or their, their guardian. Uh, and therefore, that it shouldn't be sprung you know, on children what is happening. And, and, and really, that's what's missing without having a national guidance the benefit of things like this. There's no care plan for, for any of the children at school. They just have a different system. And therefore, it's, it doesn't fit the exact circumstances of this. So although people might say you could use holding safely, it doesn't fit with what, with what people need to know in that situation. And I think the holding safety document, um, Dr Brodie Patterson, that was part of that document, did say that it was never designed for children with learning disabilities. There is a very, very small part of it that kind of touches on it, but it was never written for children with learning disabilities. Okay. That clarification is uh, very helpful in informing your understanding of the issue. Can I just ask, in terms of taking the, the issue forward, there is currently national child protection guidance, which was updated in 2014, which covers child protection issues. And there is also additional guidance for child protection for disabled children. Um, have you considered the possibility of either of those or both of those being amended? Um, or would you, are, you, are you wedded to the idea that you have to have separate national guidance? 
I think that we have to, I've spoke to Dr. Buddy Patterson, who was part of the Hope and Safety document, and it's his thoughts that um, we have to do a separate um, policy and guidelines for children with um, severe learning disabilities or learning difficulties, because they're a very different client group, and they have specific needs, and they have to be addressed in a, a bigger document, and a wider range document. Mm -hmm. And finally, can I just ask, um, have you been able to um, raise these issues directly with the Scottish Ministerial Working Group on Child Protection and Disability, and if not, why not? Um, I believe that we did try. Uh, we, we were working with an organisation in our local authority, uh, and they met some time ago, but uh, it, uh, it wasn't followed up. Um, it was, sorry, sorry, our understanding is that there was, a, there was a proposal to put it in the agenda for that working group, right, as, I, as, I, as far as I remember. I think you know, it's, yeah, that, possibly. With that. But we, it's, it, anyway, that's what, the way I understand it, but we, we haven't heard any more since then. No. Right. Okay, Not that's helpful. Perhaps else. the committee might want to follow up yeah, with sure. the ministerial working group what um, yeah. consideration they've given to mm -hmm. the issues that you've raised. Thank you. Yeah. John Wilson. Just a further question is in, in relation to a comment Mr Hood made, and that was uh, the issue about individual care plans for uh, school pupils. I, I, I know from previous experience uh, a number of years ago that I had to uh, become in, involved in a child that was in primary seven uh, and only found out after investigating the matter uh, it was a, a child with autism that there was no individual uh, care plan put in place or had been put in place. Uh, how important do you think individual care plans are for children who attend uh, any educational facility uh, to ensure that their appropriate needs are met by that uh, school or establishment? Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely essential. Um, again, can I just go back to my son? When that happened to him, he had no, no care plan, no IEP. And we had met with the school on a number of occasions, um, but it wasn't. he just didn't have a care plan at that point. And we absolutely must have this as part of their care plan. I wasn't even aware that the school could do that to a child because my son had been in a school previous to that one and with, without incident. And the only time that he was ever subjected to that was in one particular class on three days and you know he's not been affected by it since now he is another in another local authority he has a care plan he's got an IEP um, you know that that's good practice but unfortunately it, it's not the same across the board and again you know that that should really form part of the national guidelines they know that best practice dictates that yes they should have a care plan but the reality is that it doesn't always happen can I, can I just add to that? I mean, I'd be wary about adding another layer of planning within schools. Already there are coordinate support plans for children with additional social work and health input. There's individual educational programmes for children who have got special needs. And there's also the child plans being introduced. Some local authorities, 50% of kids with additional support needs, have those plans. In other local authorities, it's as low as 5 or 10%. Uh, and therefore, there's already a lot of planning structures there for reasons that I don't understand. They're not always being used currently, and it may be that these particular structures, you know, child, child plans, for example, which are just being introduced in some areas, you know, could, where necessary, introduce issues about how you handle behaviour, how you teach children communication for time out, and all sorts of other things within that. I, I suspect the, the tools are there, that for different resource reasons, they may not be being used yet. I'm interested in that response from Mr Hood, convener, because clearly the figure he gave there was in some areas it may be as low as 5 or 10 per cent, yeah. uh, in other areas it may be up to yeah. potentially up to 100 per cent. It's trying to get the consistency throughout the education system, yeah. because clearly Mrs Morrison's case is clearly highlighted in one local authority where there was no provision in place uh, for behavioural planning and yet in another authority where it is in practice, the child mm. can actually maintain uh, an educational service or be part of an educational service that is fulfilling their needs 
rather than because we haven't spoken about the seclusion issue uh, so far. Because, but I think the seclusion issue is important in the, the wider mix in terms of this petition because seclusion does mean that children are taken out of what someone in the teaching profession, whether that be the teacher or the support staff or the head teacher, decides that the child should be secluded from the rest of the educational learning that's taking place. And it's trying to make sure that those issues are highlighted and that we deal with it and we have best practice as much as possible throughout Scotland. Any other further questions? Graham Day. Speak about the seclusion. Can we just go over the seclusion just for a, a little minute or two? Kate, on yeah. you go. I think seclusion actually doesn't um, teach the child anything. I think it's just used as a method of control. Um, and um, very often, if our children are, a lot of children with learning disabilities do have a high rate of health problems and they can't communicate that perhaps they're in pain and they will use their behaviour to try and escape. So very often it's very sad that children that are in pain are getting carried along the corridors and put in these um, safe spaces, seclusion areas, um, and not even monitored or um, looked, looked at from time to time. So I think it's a very serious area, and I, I don't think um, it benefits the child in any way. I think it gives the teacher um, control of the classroom, or, uh, well, as if she'd put in the proper strategies in the first place, they probably wouldn't have had to remove the child. Can I also just add to that, if you don't mind? I think that sometimes uh, seclusion and restraint is being used as a punitive measure to punish the child. And uh, if you look at the guidelines produced by Bill, the British, British Institute of Learning Difficulties, it does actually say that you must not use restraint or seclusion to punish a child. What we need to get across to staff is teach, not punish. You cannot punish disability out of a child. You know, my, my little boy's got epilepsy. Uh, his, brain, his brain is broken. I can't help that. He can't either. He shouldn't be punished because of his disability. And th this is the key thing we're trying to get across. These children are not behaving badly just for the sake of it. They've got no control. They don't have the cognitive skills in order you know, to, to, to tantrum and, and, and be, be little ruffians. It's, it's about their disability. And we've really got to meet the needs. Graham Day, would you like to add anything? Just, just an observation, if I may convene, I, I came along as Mrs Morrison's constituency MSP today to support her, and I did so because it strikes me that what the petition in its summary calls for is, is simply reasonable and eminently sensible, um, and I'm sure you know, that's something you'll take on board when you come to your uh, conclusions. If there's no further uh, questions, the committee will now decide what action it wishes to take on the petition. Members have a note from the clerk suggesting possible courses of action. What are the members' views? Jackson Callow. Uh, I think it's been a very interesting petition. Uh, unusually, uh, it's not just set out its aims, but has set out some very specific um, objectives. Uh, and I think, which the petitioners, to be fair, have said are not necessarily exclusive. Um, or uh, finite, but nonetheless, it does set out some very specific objectives, and I think uh, it is a petition we should take forward. Uh, I think the clerks have produced a list of uh, organisations from the Scottish Government, the Care Inspector, the Commissioner for Children and Young People, Enable Scotland, Scotland's Coalition of Children's Services, EIS and Learning Disability Alliance for Scotland, to whom we should address the petition for a response, and I'm certainly supportive of that. And John Wilson? Can, we, can I add... Uh, COSLA into that list of organisations we're right to because clearly uh, based on the evidence we've heard this morning there is good practice out there uh, but there is some less than good practice being uh, carried out by some local authorities and it would be useful just to get a view from COSLA as to how they see this issue progressing uh, because clearly it would be up to local authority education departments to deliver the services we're requesting. 
Jim Eady. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'd also like us to contact Children First Scotland, and in view of my earlier comments, I think we should make a direct approach to the Scottish Ministerial Working Group on Child Protection and Disability. Is the committee happy with these recommendations? Yeah. Great. May I thank Mrs Morrison, Mr Hood and Ms Strange thanks, uh, for attending and for giving evidence today. I suspend for a minute or two to allow him to leave the table. The third new petition today is P1559 by George Nelson on disabled parking on private property. The members have a note by a clerk. The petitioner has indicated that he no longer wishes to proceed with the petition. On the basis, I invite the committee to formally close the petition. Agreed? I formally close the meeting.